Hi, I'm Valerie Irvin, Montgomery County Council Member for District 5, inviting you to join me for a conversation with Howard County Executive Ken Allman. That's coming up next, right here on County Cable Montgomery. This Snow Boundaries travels to Cuba de Ayer in Burtonsville, where Montgomery County Council Member Valerie Irvin met up with Howard County Executive Ken Ullman. Although the two counties are similar in some ways and different in others, they found much in common, including things that have nothing to do with governing. We're so excited that you're in Montgomery County. You're our, our good friend and neighbor to the north. And Thank you. So Thanks so much for having me, Valerie. It's, uh, it's great to be here, and I do live just up the road. And I must say, it is very hard to sit here, though. There's a Cuban sandwich staring at me right <laughs> on this wall. And so, uh, okay. The Rodriguez family owns this restaurant, and they've been here for a while. And it's wildly popular, so I'm glad that the camera's getting shots of how beautiful this restaurant is. And uh, for all of you who are watching this show, come on in. The food is fantastic. Great. And I'll send some friends from Howard County down please, the road. Please do. We love that. And I want to start out by just learning a little bit more about you because uh, you're in the news a lot. A lot of people have heard about you, are curious about you in Montgomery County, and we're so That's thrilled great. that we get to introduce you in our own way to, to uh, my neighbors and friends and constituents here in great. Montgomery County. So I have been told that you were born, were you the first baby born? <laughs> I was not the first, okay. I was one of the first. Okay, well, the tell us that story. Well, the President of Howard County General says I was definitely one of the first 100 babies. So wow. I figure that's close enough to uh, <laughs> one, of, one of the early days. Um, the story really is my, my parents grew up in Baltimore City and um, when they were looking for where to raise a family, Jim Rouse had bought up secretly 15,000 acres in the middle of nowhere in Columbia, Maryland or what was to be Columbia and and really um, set about to build a city based on the values of diversity, acceptance, and opportunity. And my parents fell in love with that vision and so moved to Columbia in the early days and I was one of the first babies born there and had a great upbringing, went to great public schools in, in Howard County and really um, learned great values from my folks but also from the community. And and it's, it's great that the show is called No Boundaries because that's really kind of you know, I'm a product of this region. I went, yes. uh, my folks are from Baltimore, grew up in Columbia. I went to University of Maryland at College Park, uh, met my wife there. She's from Baltimore County. And then I worked in Annapolis and went to law school at Georgetown <laughs> and lived in DC for four or five years. And my wife's office for a while was in Roslyn. And then her office uh, now is actually next to Montgomery Mall. Thankfully, she can work from home most of the time. But uh, okay. we've got lots of friends uh, in Montgomery County. We're here all the time. and so. Uh, like you said, most people don't necessarily know where the boundaries are between jurisdictions, and we're all in this together. I was at a press conference recently where I said that with uh, the mayor of Baltimore, where we got a regional grant, we're all in this together, and the only yeah. way we succeed is to be uh, to be working as partners. Absolutely, and uh, you you said to me earlier that you could probably interview yourself. Well, you just <laughs> took like three or four of my questions. Okay, I will. That's all I will right. be much more brief. I apologize. Oh no, no, I love it. I love it. Well, I want to talk to you uh, about being a product of Howard County. Sure. Um, so you were born there, you were raised there, you went to school there. Um, tell me what that's like when you're walking around in your neighborhood and people have known you for your whole life and now you're the county executive. What's that like? Well, the key difference is if people call me Kenny, oh, then, really? then I know I've known them for a long time. It's such a great perspective of sort of knowing, you know, where we've been and, and where we're going. And it's great, you know, we have so many people who leave Howard County, you know, go away for college or whatever, and come back. And people realize it's just a great place to uh, to raise a family. And so um, there's a lot of deep roots and connections there. Well, you know, I know a lot about your background because I've studied. And I know that you were only 32 years old when you became the county executive. But before that, you served on the county council. You did. So uh, in that way, you know, I've served on the county council. I'm on my second term. Mm -hmm. And you've now sort of transition to this executive position. I just couldn't sit there anymore. Uh, county council <laughs> meetings. <laughs> I'm with you. So I, I want you to talk a little bit about what that transition has been like for you as sure. a, someone who came out of local government, who is now not only the county executive, but you're president of MACO. Sure. You know, it's, um, you know, when you're on the county council and uh, I've served for four years and then uh, five years ago got elected to the to county executive, it really is a transition of um, management. 
and so it's one thing when you when you view um, the, the county issues through through passing bills and looking at the budget it's another thing when you're you know walking through the highway shops and talking to folks who are the ones out plowing the snow and and learning about what they're doing or you're you know you know I, I run a jail you know nobody gets elected to run uh -huh. a detention center but right. you got to make sure your director of corrections uh -huh. is really good because I don't ever want to hear from him <laughs> uh, you know because only people only care if things uh, go wrong with the water and sewer system things like so the so more of the nuts and bolts that um, you know the things that the public never cares about until they break until it breaks um, and just really learning how to manage Manage and learning what strategies and techniques work for for me frankly and and the biggest lesson is surround yourself with great people hire the best and let them do their jobs um, but it is a big transition you know going from one or two staff people on the council uh, to um, you know having thousands of thousands of employees who really rely on you yeah. um, but it's well, I've been been pleased with uh, or I guess the public's been pleased so far yeah they sure have because you're in your second term Right, you're you're termed out. In, I, in I am. So it was the first time I ever ran for re-election. So we won the first time by nine points, the second time by twenty-six. So uh, it was it's like a job interview after four years. And yeah, it was really really gratifying. Yeah. Yep. So you must have started your political uh, sort of where you started had to have been young because you were only thirty-two when you got elected to the to the uh, executive. Executive. Um, what happened to me was, and my parents were, you know, they were interested, they'd volunteer for candidates, but people think if you got elected young, you know, your dad must have been in Congress or something. None of that. You know, they were interested in the community, but what happened to me was I was at the University of Maryland and I got an internship in the White House in 1994, <laughs> and that just started me on this odyssey. So it was in the Clinton, or the Clinton administration first term. I was there, got assigned in political affairs and stuck around and next thing you know I was working in nine states on the re-election campaign. I left school early and um, then uh, got a job working for the governor of uh, Maryland after that and finished up school and went to law school while working uh, for Governor Glenn Denning uh, in, gosh, I guess 97, 98, 99. Um, finished wow. up law school and moved back and so it was really that odyssey, you know, I was working and living in council bluffs in Sioux City, Iowa. and. You know, running the caucuses, and the more I kept doing, the more I thought, gee, maybe good people can actually make a difference in, in this society. It, and so here we are. What a great story! I always assumed that you must have gone through college or high school and been engaged in student government. Well, or I, I, I was a little bit. I mean, my wife was the treasurer of the student government. I was just a student legislator, but I helped put together the, the election apparatus behind the scenes. So I did do a little bit of that, but that was more kind of fun um, yeah. and but I, I sort of always wanted to be involved um, but it was really the the Clinton Gore election stuff that um, that I thought well maybe I always thought I'd be behind the scenes until then I said you know what maybe maybe I will run now when I ran for the county council I didn't the woman who was on the council decided not to run again I didn't know that she was going to support her best friend and I, <laughs> I won that race by 36 votes so uh, if wow. 18 people would have changed their minds um, I wouldn't be here but uh, but but here we are so I want to talk to you a little bit about your style uh, in sure. terms of how you manage. Sure. Um, the way I'm seeing my year as council president was there might have been some things I would have done differently as a council member that I couldn't do when I was the president of the council. And so, you know, people expect you to be the same person that you were in terms of the way you do your job. And sometimes where you sit is where you stand and vice versa. So I want to talk a little bit about that with you because you've had a lot of sure. experience now yeah. uh, now as president of MACO, as county executive of Howard County, and as a, as a council member. And I, I'm really interested in hearing your perspective on that. I, I think when you're executive, at least for me, you know, I, I look back and, you know, maybe I said some things on the council that, you know, uh, I, w I would have said differently. You know, I mean, your words really do have, uh, uh, really do matter. And when you're executive, you have thousands of employees, you have those people and their, their families who are, who are relying on you, you have people who are relying on those services. When you think about public safety services and, you know, et cetera, managing through emergencies. And you really have to be very focused and very measured and, and make sure um, you're, you're serving as a leader and a, and a role model. and and um, really thinking through what you're doing. But I really also come back to somehow, and sometimes I ask them or I ask myself why, but we have been able to attract great, great people to be department heads and, and leaders throughout county government. So it really makes my job uh, uh, very easy in many cases because I set the bar very high uh, and then I hold them to it. But I give them the flexibility to do their jobs and meet those goals. Um, 
Well, I will say this uh, for on your behalf. I think people are always um, excited about a leader like you. And so it's probably a lot easier to attract the best that you can find because they want to be part of the team. And so you, I think you bring that. Well, thank you. And, and I, um, I, I tell them I want great ideas. I'll tell you whether we can afford them or not. Right. You know, I'll tell you whether they're, they're doable, but you know, give the ideas, create this great big vision, whether it's our library director, or our public health officer, or our IT director, you know, we got this great big broadband grant uh, to wire the region, really because I sat down with our CIO and he knew that I wanted big thinking and big ideas. And for all the ideas that come in that I say no, there's a few that say, you know what, we're onto something there, let's do it. Yeah, well that kind of enthusiasm is infectious. for a place to hang out on Friday nights? Then check out the Teen Escape Club. We meet once a month at the Youth Cafe, located at the East County Community Center in Silver Spring. So what goes on at the Teen Escape Club? Lots of cool things. TEC's programming team is made up of high school students so you know it's what we like. Open mic nights, poetry slams, music performances, art contests, DJs, dancing, carnivals, video tournaments, an annual talent competition, and everybody's favorite, food. At TEC, you can also learn about applying to college or even perfect your writing skills at a spoken word expo. The Teen Escape Club meets throughout the school year. To find out the exact time and dates we meet, or if you want to become a member of the TEC programming team, go to montgomerycountymd.gov. See you at TEC. As the conversation between Montgomery County Councilmember Valerie Irvin and Howard County Executive Ken Ullman continued, the talk turned to time management. So Ken, I want to talk a little bit about um, time management, personal time management with the jobs. You have two jobs, sure. pretty big jobs. Sure. And you have a wife and two daughters. How are you managing that? Uh, it's not easy, but I have a saint for a wife who uh, is is just fabulous and, and two beautiful kids. And but it's just a it's just a constant balancing act. But you know, most people go through that in their lives. Most people are very busy and you know working hard and sometimes working multiple jobs. And so I don't think we're we're, we're any different. Although it is right. a challenge. Um, and my two little kids are uh, are actresses as well. And so. You know, they've been in different productions, and so we're schlepping back and forth and getting them to where they need to be, but that's what, what parents do. Well, it's great to see you with the beautiful family oh, and young you. kids, and I think that's really inspiring. No, I mean, literally have a, a wonderful, wonderful wife who really believes that we're doing great things for people. Absolutely. And, and without that, there's no way I'd be able to, to do this. But you know about the balancing. I know the about balancing, that. Balancing I do. I, do. I have two sons, but they're grown-ups now. Uh, my youngest just turned 24. Wow. And uh, so uh, we've been through our paces through my whole sort of uh, uh, career. Uh, before I got into politics, I was a union organizer, and I, tra sure. I traveled Tra all over well, the that's, place. That's and, the other uh, thing I say mm -hmm. to my wife. You know, we have a neighbor who um, you know works for a telecom company, and he does a couple weeks at a time in Afghanistan or Iraq providing service or the military. So. You know, compared to those jobs, and you go you know, home our jobs are night. easy. Yes. Exactly. So, so I'm, uh, I'm with you. It's good to be in a place where you can get in your car and go home every night, no matter how busy you are. You know, Monday through Sunday. Uh, so uh, or, absolutely. <laughs> or the, the days do blend together. They for kind us. of blend. People say it's the weekend. I'm like, my weekend's busier than my week well, half the time. So, uh, exactly. You know, and you're always like, what day is it? Because I can never tell based I'm, on I'm the calendar. You. So I, I agree. Well, I um, am also very inspired about another story about you that I just recently found out about, and it's why you're so uh, engaged in health care. And that is a big issue for you and your mm -hmm. county, and uh, it's a hallmark issue. Right? Absolutely. But I really want to hear the sort of background story about your interest in health care. Sure. So my story is that my younger brother, Doug, uh, when, my only brother, when my only sibling, when he was 19 years old, 
He was a great soccer player first in Centennial High School and then at Brown and he was uh, at 19 was diagnosed with uh, cancer. He's now doing great by the way. I um, always tell people that at the early uh, oh, outset of the story. Yeah. He um, ha you know had a tumor that had been growing inside his chest for a long time, a rare form of cancer and um, the reason why he's with us today is because we had health insurance. You know, and so despite the fact that this national debate has gotten so partisan and so political and you know, at the end of the day I, I, I come back to the fact that my brother's with us because we had access to doctors and in this country we ought to be able to, to provide access to everyone. And so the lessons though that we learned is my brother and he's had two other forms of cancer and he's, he's still doing, doing great. Um, and he now runs the Lance Armstrong Foundation in Austin. Okay. He's the president and CEO. If you're on Twitter, he's got over a million followers. He was called uh, uh, recently the toughest, most committed fighter against cancer in this country. Um, so anytime you see Livestrong, uh, it's Livestrong CEO, and is really uh, my. Um, you know, my, my inspiration. When he was diagnosed, we couldn't find any support services for young adult cancer survivors, so we created the Ullman Cancer Fund, and we started support services here in Maryland and also up in uh, Providence and, and Rhode Island because he went back to, back to school. And we really filled a niche, and so we're a national organization based in Maryland, both in Columbia and Baltimore. And through that, he met Lance, and Lance had uh, come back from winning, uh, winning his first tour after being, you know, battling cancer, and quickly raised millions of dollars and said, "What do I do with it?" And so convinced my brother to move to Austin with some other folks, and and uh, the rest is history. And so uh, that has been my inspiration. And so when I got elected, actually before I got elected, I said, "We're going to create the model public health care community in Howard County." We created Healthy Howard. And we created a program uh, that we spun off a nonprofit and created a program to pr provide affordable access to health care for all uninsured. I convinced Peter Bielenson, who was the health officer in Baltimore City, to come to Howard County and create this program. We also have healthy restaurants and healthy schools and healthy workplaces. Um, under the uh, umbrella of Healthy Howard and we've been able to get almost half of the uninsured in Howard County uh, access to care through not just Healthy Howard but frankly getting them connected to uh, programs that they were eligible for but didn't know about it. It's been a fascinating understanding and I would just say to you Montgomery County in many ways has been an inspiration to us because Montgomery County has been doing things that other jurisdictions have not been for for years and years and so I spent the day uh, maybe four or five years ago traveling around um, uh, in Montgomery County learning the different health care resources mm -hmm. and and really we learned um, some, some some very good lessons. What an inspirational story just goes to show you that people get engaged in public life uh, for all kinds of reasons and many of us have stories sure. about what inspired us to do the things that we're doing. I, I just think that's such a fantastic example and thank so we, we thank you for what you're doing and Thanks. it's actually a great transition into talking a little bit more about other issues that sure. we share in the region sure. and um, because Howard County is situated between Baltimore and sure. Washington DC you sit in a very unique position in the yeah. region because you all get to play in both of these um, these uh, areas it's very interesting for you so. it, it, it is I mean we're and, and we've seen much more push out from the Washington region in, over the last decade than we have from the Baltimore region. We're still really part of both, but if you think, if you look at when I talk to people who've recently moved into the county, many more of them are moving out from the Washington area as opposed to the Baltimore area, and same with companies that are locating. And, and you're right about Howard County. We are the only county in Maryland that doesn't border another state or the Bay. So we, we have six other counties that border us. And so in Howard County, we really have to partner um, to be effective and, and successful. You know, we border Prince George's County, Anne Arundel County, Baltimore County, and even Carroll and Frederick County out in the western part of the county. And so it's important from a transportation uh, standpoint. And we recently uh, got um, BRT funding in the Baltimore Regional Plan to go down Route 29 to eventually uh, hook into Montgomery County from the Columbia Mall area. Um, and it really, again, is, is important that we all work together. Well, I'm really excited about the BRT. Now, this area that we're sitting in right now is going to be my new council district. So because, you will uh, border Howard County. I will I border believe. Howard yes. County. Very excited <laughs> about that. But um, talk a little bit about that BRT um, project. Sure. Yeah. You know, in Howard County, our challenge is because we are part of both regions, but we're also, um, you know, 
potentially can be left out of both regions uh, if, if we don't uh, work very effectively. And so when it comes to mass transit, we have our own local bus system, which is doing very well. We have a million trips this year. And we're part of the MARC train system. So we have MARC train stops that are packed with commuters going into Washington uh, in the mornings. And we have uh, a commuter bus system that takes people to Silver Spring, to Bethesda, to Baltimore. But we really don't have a functional, um, reliable system to, to get people from a, on, a, on a regular basis besides commuter schedules. And so the BRT is, I think, probably the most affordable, potentially realistic option that we can um, get make progress into Montgomery County uh, in the next uh, few years. Well, we totally agree because down at uh, White Oak, Sure. Uh, where FDA is located. I have two neighbors on my street who work at FDA. Perfect example. So that would be an easy connection. Absolutely. So talk a little bit about um, BRAC sure. and some other issues that we all have in common in the region. And, and BRAC, you know, Maryland, um, and, and I think of BRAC really not just in itself, but as, uh, as an example of the resources that have been placed in our great state. So BRAC has enhanced them. You know, we've got more resources from Aberdeen to Fort Meade to the uh, you know Walter Reed and and the um, the facilities uh, in in Montgomery County to Andrews Air Force Base um, and so we're very fortunate but it means we've got significant growth pressures that come along with that and so I know you recently worked very hard and were successful with like Leggett and your delegation to get additional funding to to support uh, the transportation solutions in Montgomery County which is which is uh, which is really critical we've seen just a booming out of Fort Meade um, in fact um, you know twice as many companies are in Howard County supporting Fort Meade than any other county. Um, you can see the buildings like SAIC going up on 95. They have 2,000 employees just in Columbia wow. servicing Fort Meade. So mm -hmm. the families, uh, as people have been moving, they've, um, you know, we've got great schools and resources. And so the partnership with Fort Meade has really just strengthened, uh, strengthened Howard County's uh, economic de development culture and, and uh, all of our, our quality of life. Bring your own reusable bag when you shop and starting January 1st, you'll save five cents for every store bag you don't need. A new law requires retailers in Montgomery County to charge five cents for the plastic or paper bags they provide to customers because plastic bags are the biggest single source of waterway litter. And every year, Montgomery County spends $3 million on cleanup. So do yourself and the environment a favor. Bring your reusable bag when you shop, you'll fight litter and keep the change. When This No Boundaries was recorded, Valerie Irvin was winding down her year as president of the Montgomery County Council. Given all officeholders face term limits, she asked Howard County Executive Ken Allman to reflect on what might be next for him. I want to take a little bit of time to talk a little bit more about your plans for the future, whether or not you're ready to say what those are or what they could be. I don't want to put you on the spot, no, but I did. Please, no, no. <laughs> so. no, look, I, I um, and you know, my wife reminds me that I need to find a job in three years since I am term limited. So uh, it's it's been very gratifying, flattering, humbling to, to get that question all over the state. And I've got a lot of people who are encouraging me to run for governor. I'll give a speech and people are, you know, will, will come up and say, will you do it? And so, you know, three years is, is a long time, but I do, uh, as, as my wife said, need to find a job. And, and for people to be mentioning my name in Montgomery County says a lot because uh, Howard County and Montgomery County, the thing we have in common is some of the most educated, interested, active citizens that anyone could want, which is generally a fabulous thing for us yes, elected officials. Absolutely. It, it can be, uh, the bar is set very high for us. Um, but thank you for asking, and um, I am 
president of the Maryland Association of Counties, and that's given me a great opportunity to travel the state uh, in new ways and, and meet folks. And so we'll see where things lead, but I certainly love serving the public. I, I'm still energized by it. I'm energized yeah. by new ideas. I'm energized by solving problems and finding innovative ways to do things, whether it be healthcare or this broadband initiative where together Montgomery County and Howard County and eight other jurisdictions are wiring Maryland for the, the future 21st century economy. And so, so we'll see. We'll, we'll continue this conversation. Well, can, I, can I come back and we'll do another Well, absolutely. Uh, another when, when, you de when you determine where you're going to be, uh, let's definitely come back. By the way, people ask back. me about you and your future, too. I can tell you that it's nice to be winding down. It was a, a tough year. Uh, so, but you know, you learn a lot from being in a, in a role where you have to make really tough decisions sure. and you do that every single day. Well, we do, but um, you know, when the economy uh, took its downturn, um, you know, people didn't, uh, in fact, people wanted and needed services even more. Yeah. And so it's the toughest thing to be doing in your position and mine. Uh, it's, it's a counter cyclical, if you will, where when the economy you know, takes a downturn. That's when people need you Absolutely. more for, for a hand on. And so it's, um, you know, especially with your background of working so hard for working families, mm -hmm. um, it's, it had to be incredibly challenging time for you personally uh, over the last few years to want and need to do more, but at the same time need to be dealing with fiscal realities. Well, that's the challenge of leadership. And people ask me all the time, what have you learned from the year? And, and I was just talking to my chief of staff who's sitting behind me uh, today, and I said, you know, I learned that you have to just make a decision that you think is the right one. And then, you know, there are going to be people who are going to be very angry with you, but, you know, when you go home at night, you can sit yeah. down in your house and you can say, I did what was necessary, and I think I did the right thing. The so. only reason I was chuckling, because you're exactly right, and I was thinking the other day, I was a basketball referee all through high school. <laughs> And I only thought about this not that long ago, about the skills that I learned from being a referee. You know, you prepare, you do the best you can, you see a call, you make it, you make the best call you can. It's a charge, it's a block. You got parents yelling and screaming at you, fans yelling and screaming at you, just like occasionally a citizen or two. But at the end of the day, you feel like I made the best decision with the information I had. I'm, I'm trying my best and you know my heart's in the right place and you move on to the oh, next. Oh, that's a great analogy. I think uh, there might be an essay there. There, there know. might be I, one, I but I love that. that. Referee, I'm gonna bring that one up. Uh, I wanna finish by talking about broadband sure. because you, the way you just laid that out was beautiful about why it's necessary to wire up our communities. If you can talk a little bit about that. Sure, you know, and it gets back to the, the question about BRAC, is we have so many brilliant minds here in Maryland um, doing cutting edge research, but what do we do to make sure we're staying ahead of the curve to turn this research into economic development and, and educational opportunities for all of our students? So we in Maryland together are now, through this One Maryland uh, broadband uh, initiative, are connecting virtually every school, police station, fire station, library, uh, hospital, community college, university into one network that um, will be the most wired state and region in the country. And that's exciting. I just recently led a trip to Palo Alto with economic development leaders where we partnered with companies that develop applications for education, for health IT, for public safety, and they confirmed there is not a network being built anywhere in the country that gives you access to these resources. So for the public to have our students have access to cutting edge resources and to get better medical care because it's all coordinated, you know, you go get your, you know, your CAT scan and it immediately gets sent to your doctor, to your hospital, you know, those kinds of things that this, this will not only help our citizens and save us money and be more efficient, but in fact will also create economic development opportunities. So another great example of partnerships between our two counties. No, we're very excited about this. We can't wait. Let me just say also that um, I've, this is my third show I've done. I did one with Rashern Baker, the executive from uh, Prince George's. I did uh, Congresswoman uh, Donna Edwards. And what I hope the viewing public sees when they watch this show is that we all have a uh, burning desire to serve the public, but we're just like everyone else. We have families, we, we, we work hard, we, we play hard, we, we give our best selves, 
uh, to uh, our constituents and to our residents. And Absolutely. so you have just been such a breath of fresh air. Oh, this is our you. first real sit down conversation at Cuba de Ayer. With Ayer. cameras. With cameras. <laughs> with cameras and, <laughs> <laughs> and so it's just been so terrific to have you here. I know you're a very busy person, and we can't thank you enough for taking a little bit of time out of your busy day to come out to Burtonsville. And best of luck to you in the future. Thank you. And thanks so much for hosting us, and thank you for our partnership and your leadership.